Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and it's time, it's long overdue time for another batch of Deep Space updates. Yes, my family is town, and I'm going to say, i got to pay attention to my own, very important person to me. So that's why I haven't been making nearly as many videos as I'd like to or should. Uh, but yeah, we're going to start with the rocket launches from the past couple of weeks. And we start on 17th of July with a Falcon 9 carrying Starlink Group 422. A group of 53 satellites launching from Florida and landing on Just Read the Instructions. This is booster number 1051, making its 13th flight. This uh, booster first carried DM-1 in 2019. And I think it's the oldest active booster in the fleet. There is one other booster a 1049, which flew 10 flights up to like September of last year and then disappeared into the bowels of Hawthorne for inspections. And since it hasn't been seen again, I'm presuming at this point those inspections were destructive enough that it's never flying. Uh, anyway, yeah, on the West Coast, we had a Falcon... On 22nd of July was the launch, when the launch happened, a Falcon 9 from Vandenberg carrying Starlink Group 3-2. Now, uh, this is... Well, this is an interesting one in so many ways. First of all, it's only July, and this launch marked SpaceX breaking its own annual launch record, the 32nd launch of the year. It was also SpaceX's fourth launch from the West Coast this year, which is a record for their West Coast launch facility and the fastest turnaround of their West Coast launch site. Now, it was supposed to launch the day before, but as it got down to T-46 seconds, when the computer was running everything internally, there was an abort called by the automated systems and they basically you know, triggered, they scrubbed the launch and then recycled for the next day and it went out correctly. We later found out there was a valve that was positioned incorrectly. It's not clear if that was positioned incorrectly by you know, ground people or whatever, but yeah, rare launch, uh, you know, abort for SpaceX. On July 24th, Probably the most important launch of the last few weeks was a Long March 5B carrying the Wenxian space station module for the Tianhe core, you know, Tiangong in space. So this was, uh, I mean, this is basically doubling the size of their space station. It's the laboratory cabin module. When it, it, after launch, it docked onto the forward node of the space station where it's going to get kitted out and activated by the astronauts or the, or the Taikonauts, I guess some people like to call them. Uh, and then when it's ready, they're going to use the robot arm to take that module and shift it around to one of the side ports because the front port is the one where they do all the active docking. The side ones they can dock onto or berth stuff onto using the robot arm that's on the station. Now, of course, that wasn't the end of the story because the Long March 5B is the biggest rocket that China has. And they haven't figured out a way to deorbit that upper stage within any controlled manner. So they left a 25 ton, 100 foot long piece of space junk in orbit in a very low orbit. And about six days later, it eventually deorbited with dropping debris over Malaysia. It was coming very close to me in California and I was really hoping to see something, but no. Uh, we did get to see some nighttime space debris breaking up. Uh, very cool looking, but yeah, if only China had the capability of deorbiting stuff under control. Uh, yeah, so around, well, on the same day, there was also another SpaceX launch of a Starlink Group 425. This is uh, another reused booster. There was one that was used to carry Inspiration4, and the crew signatures are apparently still visible if uh, people on the ground are to be, you know, you get cool photos of this. Uh, the fairings on this also weren't recovered, which is kind of a, a change. I think it's just because the fairings were particularly old, like one of the fairing halves is believed to have flown seven times, and I guess at some point they just want to let the fairings die. The liftoff also from uh, 39A is beginning to look progressively different. If you've been paying attention, you'll be seeing the Starship launch tower building up next to it, and it's usually it's frequently in the same frame depending upon the camera angle. On the 27th of July, a new rocket called the ZK-1A, carrying six non uh, six satellites, basically. This is a non-government launch uh, rocket, basically, and uh, from China. What that means is it's a supposedly private entity that's spun off from the Chinese Academy of Sciences. It's called CAS Space, also known as Yonki uh, Aerospace. It's basically another four-stage solid rocket booster, which 
all of these Chinese private companies appear to be using. And uh, on the 29th of July, there was also a Long March 2D, a military launch for the Chinese military carrying three Yaogan 35 military reconnaissance satellites. These went into 500 kilometer, 35 degree orbits. There was a previous Yaogan 35 launch in July. So it looks like they're building this up into some sort of multiplane constellation. We don't know what they are, but it, there's some speculation these might be more electronic intelligence satellites. One interesting thing though, was the patch showed something odd on the payload adapter which was left in orbit. And it looks like a drag sail to make that stage deorbit more rapidly than uh, it would otherwise you know, due to atmospheric drag. So you see, so China does actually sometimes care about deorbiting its stuff uh, quickly, if not necessarily accurately. And on the 1st of August, there was a Soyuz 2.1V launch from Plisset carrying uh, Cosmos 2558. And the exact time of the launch meant that it was launching into the same orbital plane as USA 326, which is presumed to be a US optical reconnaissance satellite. And the theory now is that Cosmos 2558 is basically an inspection satellite that's going to get up close to the American satellite and try to inspect and figure out if there's anything cool or interesting there. So yeah, that is the list of launches. There was an attempt to launch another Rocket Lab uh, launch, but it, it failed, or it didn't fail, it, uh, it was scrubbed due to weather. Now, as I mentioned, China dropped a giant piece of debris over Malaysia, and that probably explains why some of the press in some parts of the world are making a lot of noise about debris being found in Australia from a SpaceX launch. And it looks like this is the trunk from Dra the Dragon used for SpaceX Crew-1 launched a couple of years ago. So, you know, when they do the deorbit, they jettison the tank, the, the trunk first, and then perform the deorbit burn so that they need less fuel to actually hit their target site. It just basically is a safety thing that makes it easier or safer for the astronauts. And the trunk is not that big and heavy. It's made of low density like uh, you know honeycomb materials with carbon fiber cover and coating. And it was expected to largely burn up, but some fairly large chunks have been seen on the ground in Australia. The largest part I think they found is about 30 kilograms, but because it's so low density, it looks particularly large. Yeah, um, this is something that SpaceX should probably think a little more about. It would be, I think they expected that this kind of low density material would be, is not designed for atmospheric entry and would very easily demise. But I think that it's also so low density that it decelerates quickly enough that it can survive in fairly substantial chances. So maybe they need some, uh, some mechanism to actually break this up a little more. Um, Okay, what else has been happening? This is this is going to be a real fast update. First of all, Mast and Space Systems, who I want I wanted to be successful. They've built all these really cool vertical landers and everything. They filed for Chapter Eleven bankruptcy, and that means obviously they think this company can be restructured and continue to operate if the right deals are found with the creditors, but. Pretty much that means that they're not going to be able to do their CLIPS contract to send a spacecraft to the moon. It sounds like there's, uh, oh, there was another company that's also, oh, I forget, but there's another company, I'm putting put the name at the bottom, that was is all ready to pick up their launch contract with SpaceX. They're also sending a CLIPS spacecraft to the moon. Uh, and yeah, they're just going to have to figure out their way around other creditors. And if they can't, then the company may close up for good. Um, Arca Aerospace, another small aerospace company. Yes, I've already made a video about this. They published their uh, AMI initiative prospectus or whatever, saying, please give us money. And I'm going to say I read, and it's all like supposed to be asteroid mining initiative. I, I, I obviously as a pilot, I read AMI as Alpha Mike Indio, India, but as I was looking at it, it began to look more like Whiskey Tango Foxtrot. Yeah, watch the video on that. It looks like there's plans afoot or plans in progress to change the Mars sample return uh, mission. What they're seeing now is that after like a year or so on Mars, Perseverance looks like it, it is indeed persevering. And so they're leaning into 
keeping the samples on board the rover for as long as possible and, and they don't think they're going to have to cache them. And more importantly, I think the plan is to replace the rovers that we're going to do sample collection if, if needed with helicopters. So we're going to get like actual helicopters, more like scientific instruments on helicopters on Mars. Uh, I'll, we'll see where this actually goes, but it's definitely uh, something to watch. Uh, okay. Oh yeah, Chinese space program. They, re they released some very, very awesome footage of uh, their old YF-100 uh, engine development. So the YF-100 is the engine that's used on their kerosene liquid oxygen boosters, right? So this is their new generation of boosters that aren't running the nasty, horrible propellants and aren't dropping pieces on people nearby, they're just dropping pieces on people randomly over the world. So these are staged combustion, oxidizer-rich staged combustion, you know, engines that run on kerosene liquid oxygen. And they, yeah, they revealed some footage showing an explosion of a booster during a test, which is, well, extraordinarily uh, open of China to admit that he might have had some test failure at some point. Uh, like... Yeah, you know, it happens to everyone. It doesn't make you look weak unless you hide it. Oh yeah, going forward. Oh yes, of course. Uh, on the other side of things, Russia. We, we were wondering what would happen with the new uh, you know, Borisov, Yuri Borisov, becoming in as a head of, the, the, of Roscosmos. Well, apparently very early in interviews, he's already been saying that Russia will be leaving the International Space Station after 2024. Now, some sources then turn that into Russia will leave the ISS in 2024, but then NASA pointed out that they haven't been notified and therefore Russia has no intention of leaving the International Space Station project in 2024. So I think it's safe to say that they're just saying after 2024, which probably means when they get some alternative ready and hopefully before uh, 2030. I did actually see a really good thread on what plans for a Russian space station might actually be. And it does look interesting that Russia is really, well, potentially could lean into the fact that they have these high inclination launch sites and can't get down to say where the Chinese space station is, which, they're, which they've talked about partnering with. They might launch a polar space station, which is an idea that's been pitched in the past, hasn't actually gone anywhere. And I'm sure Russia could do this and might actually bring some genuine contributions to the world with their space research, uh, which would be great because they're currently not helping in other ways. Uh, okay. Oh yes, uh, OneWeb. Res, remember about a year ago, OneWeb was uh, getting into financial troubles and uh, the British government came in saying, you know, all post brexit we are going to show that Britain can do stuff in space on its own without Europe and all those other countries. So they saved OneWeb, brought them back to life, and they continued launching and everything. Well, OneWeb is now merging with the French company Eutelsat because Eutelsat has, um, or it, they have geostationary satellites, OneWeb is going to have low Earth orbit satellites, and together they can form a much more resilient network. So yes, so much for your Brexit metaphors there. Uh, yeah, this is basically a, it's a stock acquisition going forward, and it, it you know, I, I think this will handle, this will go well. Uh, I mean, making themselves bigger will make it easier for them to compete with Starlink, which is kind of important. Uh, so the European Space Agency also confirmed this morning that uh, Sentinel-1B, which is a synthetic aperture radar satellite launched in 2016, that is officially dead. They're now accelerating the launch of Sentinel-1C. I guess, I don't know if this is big news or not, but I saw it in my feed this morning, so it's in there. Um, this will probably be a launch on a Vega 1C. The previous ones were launched on Soyuz, but obviously that is no longer an option. Oh, oh yes. Around a couple of weeks ago, there was this cryptic tweet, basically tweeted out a trailer from Impulse Space and Relativity. So Relativity Space and Impulse Space are going to send a private mission to Mars in the coming decade. They've actually talked about the 2024 window as being the earliest possible. I very much doubt that'll happen, but this is supposed to be a private commercial mission to Mars and they're looking for people to you know, put instruments on it. Now, Impulse Space, you may not have heard of, right? Relativity, you know, they're the 3D printing rocket people. Impulse Space, that is Tom Miller's uh, new company. And I think it's 
interesting that they chose to uh, go with Relativity as their launch provider rather than SpaceX, because of course Tom Miller basically built the engines for the Falcon 9, and he's been a long-term employee, you know, long-term uh, ally of SpaceX in the past. Now, Relativity are also in the process of getting ready for their first launch, and they've been publishing some uh, your footage from various tests, you know, spin prime cycles, actual hot fires of their first launch vehicle. Uh, I'm very excited to see them getting this far. This has the potential to be the first methane oxygen rocket to get into orbit. Obviously, SpaceX were the first people to fly substantial engines, but they haven't got anywhere near orbit with their Starship. And, you know, Star Booster 7 is currently back in the high bay for inspection slash repair. So, yeah, looking forward to this launching uh, in the coming months. We're also looking forward to the launch of uh, Firefly, you know, launch number two. So, that, you know, a couple of new rockets that might make it to orbit in the, ne in the coming months. SpaceX uh, ha also have news because their booster for Crew-5 was damaged in transit from Hawthorne to McGregor. This is a rare case where SpaceX were standing up a new booster and you might as well do it on a crew flight where you've got, you know, uh, people that want the freshest booster possible. So they basically transport these across the US on road with like, you know, big, long, large load warning signs and everything. And apparently they managed to hit a, a bridge or something near Van Horn in Texas while they were transporting it to the McGregor testing site so that they could actually do a hot fire. Now, it, it looks like the interstage bore the brunt of the impact. Now that's made of this, you know, honeycomb, carbon fiber coated material. And they're gonna have to basically replace huge chunks of that and verify that the booster is ready to launch. But it sounds like they're still, it sounds like they can, the earliest they can launch is September 29th. So it's not a massively long delay because you know, you've got to account for the repair time, the test time and getting it to uh, Florida. So like the repairs aren't going to take that long by the sound of things. But yeah, I do find it interesting that Van Horn is basically where Blue Origin has its launch site. Like, was this an act of sabotage? Probably not. But hey, it's fun to speculate for giggles, right? Finally, NASA is getting ready to launch SLS, uh, possibly by the end of this month. Uh, <laughs> and of course, they're now getting also sort of transitioning the whole morass of contractors that were involved in this. They're trying to rationalize them into one sort of umbrella corporation that NASA deals with. So there's basically a new corporation that's created for SLS launch services. It's managed by Boeing and Northrop. This is what they did for the space shuttle, right? Rather than NASA dealing with a million contractors, they now have one company that is an umbrella for all of them. So that's the sort of indication that NASA is getting ready to really move forwards uh, in an operational manner with SLS. But I think the best piece of SLS news in the last couple of weeks is the fact that the European Space Agency is going to be flying a zero-g indicator on board. One of my favorites, Sean the Sheep. Yes, I've been a big fan of Nick Park for a long time. Well, of course, everybody loves a grand day out, you know, flying to the, the moon for some cheese. So uh, Sean the Sheep going to space, the sheep jumps over the moon. I, I like that. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.